Oh, awesome. Thank you. Save this for posterity. <laughs> Um, so welcome everybody. Thank you for coming to this special session. Um, we're really excited to answer all of your questions that you might have kicking around about the recreation menu or other menus. So we want this to be useful. We want it to be informal. Please interrupt us, um, chat in your questions. Um, we'll do our best to stop and answer them in real time. Um, so, you know, anything that's been on your mind, please feel free to bring it up here. And uh, while I'm talking, at least, Leslie and Danielle, please keep me honest in terms of pausing to answer chat questions if those come in. Awesome. So today we're going to be focusing on the recreation menu, but also just talking a little bit more uh, specifically about menus in general and the menu effort. So. Um, where are we coming from in thinking about adaptation menus of strategies and approaches? These were really tools that were created to help in adaptation planning. And back in the very early days of NIACS, of our organization, when we were first thinking about climate change tools, uh, we actually had a, a group plan to create a guidebook on climate change. So something that would offer a set of actions that you should follow if you were experiencing certain climate change risks. And although I was not there at the time, what I heard is that this idea really failed dramatically. It, it didn't work very well. Um, we quickly realized that creating a guidebook uh, was, really, was really difficult to do um, because every situation is so different. It was really difficult to do in a way that was applicable to a wide variety of people and a wide variety of landscapes. And so at that point, the effort pivoted from this idea of, you know, providing rules on how to respond to climate change or providing prescriptions um, and trying to develop a tool that could really support uh, people in making their own decisions and support some level of flexibility. And that's really where a lot of our adaptation planning process is coming from. And then, of course, the menu effort also recognizes that people are going to be approaching the issue of climate adaptation from a variety of disciplines or natural resources perspectives. Um, so, you know, wildlife, forestry, and recreation are the examples that we have here. Um, but there are others contained in that menus list as well. And the response to creating that flexible approach was, of course, the adaptation workbook and using this as a decision support tool, which you're quite familiar with at this point, having been through many of these steps. And then the development of some companion resources that we use particularly in this step four, um, again, to help people pick and choose what's right for their project and to make decisions uh, on adaptation responses in a way that's, that's flexible and that um, can vary according to the situation. Um, so I kind of gave away the, the tagline here, but the key is flexibility in this process. It's not prescriptive. Um, it's a little bit of a choose your own adventure in terms of um, starting with your own goals and then deciding what works for you from an adaptation perspective. So after that preamble, I'm gonna go through just some basic review on what is a menu. Some of this we talked about on Monday, so it might be a little bit of repeat for folks who made that lecture um, and why these menus are important. And then I'm gonna kick it over to Leslie who will talk more about the recreation menu specifically and how that was put together, how it was built and some of the specifics from that recreation menu. And if there is enough time at the end, and if people are interested, then we can go through examples of other menus as well and talk about, um, talk about the background on some of those. So really what we're trying to do with the adaptation menu is provide a list of possible actions that are all you know, based on the available science, based on available management expertise, um, that you can pick and choose from based on what's relevant to your particular location and your conditions that you're dealing with. And roughly the adaptation menus um, use these three overarching adaptation concepts as a way of organizing. Um, so many of our adaptation menus kind of move from resistance to resilience to transition ideas as you go down the menu. 
So um, on the, the resistance end of that, those might be ideas that focus on trying to reduce climate impacts on a system or um, trying to avoid change, trying to maintain a system as it currently is. So perhaps you have something like a cross-country ski trail and you want to make sure that that trail stays used for cross-country skiing as long as it possibly can. Um, so you want to maintain those conditions for it moving into the future. And then moving further down the menu, generally we tend to have more transition type of concepts. So uh, many transition actions are intentionally encouraging change and maybe looking forward to a new type of system that might be more climate adapted. So in a transition situation, you might be looking at actions that help convert those cross-country ski trails from one use to another and then making plans to intentionally um, transition those uses or uh, you know, accelerate the use of them for non-skiing purposes. And then, uh, you know, as I mentioned before, there are many different menus out there that are focused on different natural resource areas. And that's really just recognizing that people are approaching this from different management perspectives. Uh, but I will say that if you look through all of the menus, you will find a lot of overlapping ideas because, you know, some actions that you might use in a forested situation might be very applicable uh, for wildlife as well and creating better habitat for wildlife. So there will be parallel ideas. There will be overlapping ideas between these menus. Um, and they do draw from one another somewhat although um, we try to make them as targeted as possible to an audience focused on that management topic. Just a reminder of some of the menus that we have available and um, this URL will turn out to be pretty important because it's kind of the central organizing URL that lists all of the menus that are out there. Um, these were all created in slightly different ways with slightly different partners. And so um, this is our attempt to, to unify all of them in one central location where you can uh, go to wherever they're housed and find out more about them. So this URL will provide you links to these menus. Uh, and uh, in the cases of those menus that aren't published, it will provide you a contact um, for that menu. And I, I know we're coming from a, a wide variety of areas, geographical areas in this course. Uh, so I do want to mention that, you know, we are, we are obviously not the only group in the United States working on climate adaptation and natural resources management. There are many others out there and other great adaptation ideas. And so one of the, the places that we try to point people towards is um, the Climate Change Resource Center which has a lot of adaptation ideas compiled into this compendium of adaptation approaches. So, you know, we talk a lot about the menus and we think that they're kind of easy to, to distill and use along with the workbook format, but this can be a great resource for browsing what other adaptation ideas might be out there. And so um, for those of you who are out West, you might be familiar with the group Adaptation Partners. They've contributed a lot of adaptation ideas to this compendium. So it can, can be a fun, fun one to look through. Okay, I'm gonna go briefly through why these adaptation menus are important, what we think they help do before kicking it over to Leslie to talk about the recreation menu. Oh, I should pause there and just see, are there any questions about any of that before I move on? Okay, thank you for um, sticking those links in the chat. So uh, we mentioned this earlier this week, but the, the menu format was really designed to help address some of the challenges that we were hearing from uh, partners and from managers that they were dealing with in response to climate change planning. So I'm gonna go through each of these in the next couple of slides. Uh, the first challenge 
um, tended to be a big one. You know, many times when you're out there, you're looking through climate change literature, you're looking for adaptation ideas. Sometimes those ideas can come at very different scales. So there's a lot of resources that are, you know, thinking about general adaptation ideas at a larger landscape scale and some that are focused on really specific adaptation actions for particular case studies. Um, and sometimes that can be really hard to sort through. So the idea of the menu is to kind of group these adaptation ideas by scale. So, you know, starting with these big organizing principles of resistance, resilience, and transition, and then moving down to broad strategies and slightly more specific approaches, and then providing a few example tactics that are those specific actions that will be developed for each individual site. So just providing a way to step down from the broad to the specific. Um, an example of what this might look like. So overall, if you are looking at the concept of resilience, so you want to, you know, promote persistence of your system on the landscape, but maybe allow for a little bit of, of change and disturbance to come in. You want it to bounce back after that disturbance. Um, a strategy that you're thinking about might be to manage impacts from shifting visitation and use trends. And within that, um, you know, maybe you're thinking about optimizing the timing of opportunities to align better with changing conditions. So a tactic within that might be, you know, you want to keep campgrounds open for a longer period of time to accommodate a longer shoulder season or a longer recreation season. So again, kind of moving from the broad to the specific and then showing how that specific idea of keeping a campground open for longer connects to your overall adaptation intent and direction. A second advantage to the menu, at least from our perspective, is to really make actions intentional. So because it moves from that broad to specific, it gives you a chance to really articulate why you're doing what you're doing on the ground. So at the broader level, you know, these options and strategies help really describe the direction of your adaptation, the overall goal of your adaptation. You know, we're really trying to um, change our recreation options to better reflect future conditions. So I'm going to do these things on the landscape. Or, you know, we're really trying to keep our you know, winter activities on the landscape as long as possible. So I'm doing these other types of activities. So in this way, it kind of really helps you um, define and communicate the intent of where you're going with your adaptation. So of course, this is tied in with that, communicating your ideas. Uh, so hopefully once you've been through this process and you've used the menu in conjunction with the workbook, um, it will make it a little bit easier to tell that coherent story to your audiences or your partners or your board members, um, whoever you might be uh, trying to, to demonstrate your project to, um, to, to really give them the full trajectory of, you know, how you considered climate change and why you're doing what you're doing on the ground and why you feel it's necessary. So again, because it's, it's connecting that intent to those actions, we feel that the menu can be a valuable communication tool. And one of the ways that we try to, to help groups do this and, and encourage you to share your story is through um, our demonstration projects. Um, so I apologize, this is the wrong URL at the bottom. Not sure how that one snuck on there. <laughs> Maybe Danielle can, can chat in the correct URL. Um, but this is a map representing different projects that have been through the adaptation workbook process. Um, not all of these are available at that URL. There's a subset of them that have agreed to create a demonstration page and provide an example of how their group considered climate change and what adaptation actions they chose. Um, but if you visit that URL, you can, you can click on these dots, you can see how other groups are communicating their story uh, to people and their adaptation intent. 
And then finally, we hope that the menus help people think a little bit outside of their uh, maybe more uh, accepted or more traditional management actions, think a little bit outside the box in terms of how to creatively approach new problems and new situations that maybe you haven't had to deal with in the past. So um, maybe there's a, a idea on there that, you know, you really haven't considered before, but you start to think, oh, okay, well, how would this look in my system? You know, could we potentially do something like this? Um, are there examples out there of, of uh, creating this type of infrastructure that can help with my problem? So um, creativity boosting is, is one hopeful outcome that we have of using these menus. So with that, I will turn it over to Leslie to take us through the recreation menu. And Leslie, do you want to share your own screen? Yes. Here we go. Thanks, Kristen, for that introduction. So we've talked about what a menu is, why they are important, and now we're going to be talking about how they are built. I'll be focusing in on the recreation menu for this example. Menus are created um, basically um, from this recipe. So a need from the community. So someone comes to us and says, you know, we really need a list of potential options for how we would adapt um, this resource to climate change. And the menus that you have so far just aren't cutting it. And by working with the community that requested this, we develop a menu that's tailored to their needs. We work with partners. We don't do this alone. We work with experts in that particular resource area to ensure that the menu reflects um, real world examples, um, the best available science, and um, the needs of the practitioner. We conduct very big literature reviews. Um, some of these have hundreds of citations, both from the gray literature and from the scientific literature. And by gray literature, I mean like government reports and other things like that. Um, we test them in real world situations. So every menu that's published has been tested in at least a couple of locations before it is, it is published. It's peer reviewed, um, either as a technical report through um, the USGA or the Forest Service, or in a um, peer reviewed journal and published. And so the menus that you're using are something that's gone through this really extensive process to ensure that you're getting um, sound management ideas that are reflective of the best available science or a little bit of rock and a little bit of roll. <laughs> My dad was really into Starship, actually. Now you can think about whether this is the worst song of all time. I'm not sure, it might be. All right, for the recreation menu, uh, our scope and scale was an all lands approach, um, which meant that we were looking at both um, public lands as well as private lands. And our focus was the continental Uni United States. Um, we didn't really um, do a lot of extensive research on like, Hawaii, for example. So if you're working in Hawaii, there are some other resources available, um, but there might, you might not find as many examples that are um, related to your ecosystems. Um, the focus was on natural resource related recreation. So we did not focus on indoor recreation or really highly developed recreational sites, but we um, are thinking about um, some level of development and infrastructure. And it was designed to be used with our adaptation workbook that you're using in this course. We did a comprehensive literature review 
as well as conducted interviews with 28 recreation professionals, researchers, academics, and climate change scientists from across the country. And this was published just over a year ago. Um, our lead author was Dan O'Toole, who is um, a Forest Service employee and was on detail with us. And then Kristen and I um, and Danielle were all involved in the creation of this menu. And so um, there's a um, free publication link that has been provided in your syllabus. Um, and um, <laughs> is there, is there a, uh, there's, I like the chat about we built the city now. I'm gonna have to listen to that afterwards. <laughs> My dad would always put it on on Saturdays when he was cleaning the house <laughs> and it drove me nuts. Um, but I want to also um, get back to the, to the recreation menu here. <laughs> even though Starship is an important topic, um, that you can download this paper and most relevant to you might be the supplemental, supplementary material that is provided. And that includes a list of example tactics that um, you could potentially take. So some of these are in the online version of the menu, but there's even more examples in this paper. So if you're really wanting to dig deep on a particular approach and think about tactics or maybe find out um, what the supporting literature is that supported that particular tactic, I would recommend going into this publication. We also have the interactive menu available on the Adaptation Workbook website. So in your course materials, when you get to step four, there are links up there for the different menus. So if you click on the recreation menu, you will get to this interactive menu. And if you click on a strategy, then it will take you to this particular section where it will describe the uh, overall strategy as well as the underlying approaches and example tactics. So you have that option of either going to the underlying journal article or to this interactive menu. So now we're going to take you on a tour of some example menus and we'll focus on the recreation menu but then we'll have an opportunity to check out some of the other menus if we have time. And feel free to stop me and ask questions at any time or make commentary about We Built the City. That's also highly recommended. <laughs> All right. So first we're gonna go to re recreation. So the recreation menu, as Kristen had mentioned, is organized in this broad framework of resistance, resilience, and transition. So the first couple of strategies are really focusing on protecting your infrastructure and protecting your recreation opportunities from climate-related stressors. The middle couple are more about building that resilience, um, allowing for some change, but returning to previous conditions after disturbance or um, maybe the timing uh, or, or types of risks are going to change a little bit, but the overall opportunities that you're offering are similar. And then the last couple strategies are where we're thinking about altering the recreational opportunities to align with expected conditions. So I'm gonna walk through each of these strategies and give you a little il illustration of a of an approach and then an example tactic. So um, strategy one is about protecting and sustaining key infrastructure. So an example approach is to stabilize shorelines to reinforce vulnerable infrastructure. 
So an example could be something like installing seawalls for protection. So again, this is a very protective measure. This is something that you're doing to try to keep whatever it is intact and similar to what it has been before. Strategy two is about enhancing measures to prevent ecological damage from variable precipitation. So the first one was more infrastructure focused. Um, this one is more ecologically focused, um, but there are some areas of overlap within them as well. Um, so strategy three, 2.3 is minimize impacts of existing roads and trails that are compromised by changing conditions. Um, so an example tactic might be installing boardwalks in areas that are more likely to be flooded or waterlogged for longer periods of time. So lots of people do this already in wetlands, um, but if your floodplain is expanding um, or things are just becoming wetter overall, you might want to consider alternatives um, for your trails. Strategy three is managing impacts from shifting visitation and use trends. So an example approach under that would be 3.1 to we redirect visitor access away from at-risk areas. So an example tactic might be um, sand fences in sensitive dune areas. And so if your, your shorelines are becoming more unstable, perhaps you are just setting up some fencing around an area to protect those dunes. Something maybe you have done already, but you're just integrating um, some more considerations of protection to um, minimize visitor impacts. Strategy four is account for and communicate risks to health and safety. So these are really focused on the human element of recreation, a lot about communication and awareness. So one example would be improving public awareness regarding climate change and climate induced risks. So one idea here, this is actually one that came up in a recent um, workshop we had with the Mark Twain National Forest was having some sort of flash flood warning system that is able to reach people in remote areas. And so could you have some sort of alarm or have some sort of um, sign or expand cell phone use in an area so that people get those warnings on their cell phones. And so if you do have a flash flood coming through, people can be evacuated more quickly. Managing Recreational opportunities to address impacts of expected conditions is strategy five. So this is when we're getting more into that transition zone. So an example would be um, employing snow-based options that are functional in low snow conditions. Or maybe you have complete alternatives. So here, um, in you might install dry ski slopes in areas where you can still do skiing in an area where you no longer have a consistent snowfall. And strategy six is about altering recreation opportunities to accommodate expected conditions. So this may, might mean rethinking what types of opportunities you're offering where that infrastructure is located, um, thinking about the materials you're using, um, completely rethinking what it means for this site and what your objectives are. So an example approach here might be to relocate existing infrastructure and opportunities to areas with less risk of climate-induced damage. 
So this could be something like rerouting a trail. So um, a very simple thing that people are doing often anyway, but doing it in a climate informed way. Are there places that are just always going to be eroded or flooded or otherwise just not really viable trails anymore? And can we reroute those trails to new places? And I, the idea we want to get across here is a lot of the techniques are things that you're doing anyway, but you might be applying them to a new situation or to deal with a different um, hazard than you had been in the past. Sorry, I'm not paying attention to the chat. Um, Yeah, Leslie, we've got one longer question that we can maybe okay. address after having to you do with okay. the interagency visitor use management framework. All right. So that was the tour of the recreation menu. And now we can take a tour of any of these other menus if people are interested in. So just shout out if there's something else, or we can stop and chat a little bit more about the rec menu. Uh, somebody wants to look at forestry. Sure, we can go there. Kristen, do you want to give people a tour of the forestry menu? Sure, I can do that. That's our original menu. Um, Leslie, maybe while I do that, I don't know if, Anne, you want to pipe up with your question, but since it involves more of that recreation focus, maybe we can um, address that not... here. The fancy link didn't take me to the right place, so I'm no, like, that's okay. It's, yeah, it was because you guys changed the formatting. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's the first menu, so. Um, maybe we do we not have it. It's in unless you deleted it. <laughs> if you go to the grid view, it'll be easier to find it. Yeah. Anywhere. So did you want me to throw out, this is Sandy, did you want me to throw out my question or do you want to wait until after we go through this menu? Um, go ahead with your question. Okay, so um, the interagency visitor use management framework for sort of like evaluating visitor use management, pretty self-explanatory, mm -hmm. but it's a pretty, mm -hmm. pretty kind of like systematic um, framework for going through a process for doing visitor use management planning. And I was just wondering whether anyone's um, looked at this adaptation workbook in parallel with the, the VUM framework to see if there are opportunities for some integration, um, given they're both fairly systematic in their approaches on how to address management issues. Seems like there's an opportunity there if it hasn't been done before. Yeah, that's a new new one for me. So I'll, I'll have to take a look at it. Um, we haven't we haven't been aware of that. And you know what? I cannot find the forestry menu. <laughs> well, um, actually, just go to forested watersheds, and then Kristen can riff on the difference between the two. Yeah, that would be a, a good one. That's but what yeah, I was thinking. You guys deleted the forestry slide. <laughs> and I think forested watersheds probably more what I want to hear actually than forestry per se. So perfect. Woo, thanks for bailing us out on that one. <laughs> um, sorry, did we have anything else to to take on Anne's question before I dive into forested watershed? Our, our, yeah, um, and Danielle, feel free to pipe in because yeah. or take over because this is your menu. <laughs> oh, I, I just wasn't sure if we had answered vis the visitor use management framework question first. I don't, yeah. I don't know en enough about that program, but it seems obvious in the strategy section that might be a nice opportunity to plug in, um, well, but thanks. I don't know enough. Yeah, thanks for alerting us to that and we'll take a look. And I put a link to the, um, the website in the chat too for folks reference. Yeah, thanks. Awesome, yeah, I was, I was pausing on that one because I didn't know a lot about it. So I was like, oh, well maybe Leslie or Danielle have <laughs> more insight on this. So, um, so yeah, thanks for bringing that up, Anne. Um, let's see, Danielle, do you want to take this one since it's kind of your baby? Yeah, I, oh, it's not my baby. It is a baby. Um, okay, I will do it really quick. So I am um, 
the author, uh, with a lead author on the Forested Watershed Adaptation Menu. And um, just, you know, very similarly to the recipe that we gave, it's definitely a teenager, um, the recipe that we provided earlier, this menu, like many others, precipitated out of this need from the community to do more than just forestry, because this is actually the first menu that um, sort of opened the, the floodgates to um, more perspectives in the room outside of uh, rural forestry and urban forestry and agriculture. So um, this menu actually came about because people got really upset. Or no, no, that's a different menu. Got upset during my meeting. Um, but we were funded through GLRI to come up, which is a, a big program in the Great Lakes area. We were sort of charged with this funding to come up with a tool that people who are thinking about um, forested systems but have this water perspective could use in their um, in their planning. So basically, to summarize here, um, we wrote the document, then we vetted it with with a, a lot of different people from the Midwest and the Northeast, and then iterated based on those that feedback. Um, okay, next slide. So this menu is um, very similar to the forested menu in that it does really focus on forests within, you know, a watershed system. So if you were, you know, if you if you seem to have forests or maybe your project is located in a floodplain riparian area, maybe it includes forested wetlands or it's within this lake watershed, then this menu might be for you. Uh, it really does uh, capitalize on some of the ideas within the forest menu, which are related to managing forests, even though we, we didn't go through that, but that is really the central tenant of the forest menu is thinking about forests and how to manage forests in the context of climate change. This menu does that, but it adds that additional layer of thinking about soils and hydrologic variability and even infrastructure that you might find within a forested watershed system. Uh, there's five strategies, 28 approaches, and infinite tactics. Uh, <laughs> but you can download the whole document, read the whole thing in more depth um, at the website, the web link there. Um, but also, it's, it's fully included in the online adaptation workbook. And yep, this is just going into more detail to say that, um, you know, when we think about forests and water forested ecosystems that are within this watershed context, um, I just wanted to point out that we, although we are thinking about forests, this menu helps us identify those additional co-benefits that forested um, systems provide related to managing forests for better downstream water quality or managing forests to help improve aquatic habitat. Um, you know, we're always thinking about, especially in, in drinking water watersheds, we're thinking about how to sustain forests, good healthy forests to protect that water quantity. So we have that sustainable uh, water down for years to come. And then also thinking about infrastructure and facilities as well. Uh, the strategies themselves, uh, you can see on the left-hand side, are um, really just fundamental key concepts when we're thinking about watershed management. You know, every menu has this idea of sustaining those fundamental processes, and that's a big part of the forest watershed menu, you know, like getting that system back online, getting that function up to where it should be, and then starting to think about these additional layers. So that's strategy one. Strategy two directly talks about um, thinking about management in the context of water quality. What can we do to maybe reduce that, that climate increased in water temperature? You know, maybe that's a tactic to provide more shade or to prioritize your management and protection in those headwater areas. Um, there's also approaches within that to help reduce soil erosion and loss and, and nutrient pollution. The third approach, the third strategy is all about forests. You know, it's very copy paste from the forest menu. It's just about, you know, doing what you can to improve that age, that structure, that diversity, and the function of a, of a very good, healthy forest. Um, and it also includes these more transitional ideas with uh, ideas to favor future adapted native species or, um, you know, helping to find those refugia areas on the landscape. If you have a sensitive species that might be threatened by climate change, you can take steps to actually um, really protect them in spots that you think will help to keep them alive, like cooler spots on the landscape. The, the right hand side of the screen is kind of the more fun side for me. It really does, um, I think, make that solid connection between 
forest and watershed management and climate change in that uh, for me when it coming from a hydrologic perspective in that by selecting approaches within this strategy five accommodating hydrology you're sort of saying right on paper the system is changing and i am managing for an altered condition so within strategy five all of those approaches are about taking different steps to manage that system so that maybe it's more drought tolerant or taking steps to help that system cope with more water on the landscape or, or more instances of runoff. So I think in, in a big way, strategy five is really that a great elevator pitch to say, I'm taking this seriously and I'm actually doing something a little bit different than maybe I would have in the past. The last strategy, strategy six, is all about infrastructure because we know that the huge piece of watershed management is thinking about these barriers to flow. So if we have to worry about them, we might as well do something about it as well. And strategy six is all about um, maybe you have access points that are immovable or they're just, it is the only one there. So you're going to want to make sure that an approach that is within strategy six is all about reinforcing that piece of infrastructure so it can cope with um, maybe varying stream flow and, and disturbance. That strategy six infrastructure actually then goes into um, supporting, uh, actually integrating low impact development into your designs. So maybe for all of you that might be incorporating um, pervious pavement or um, opportunities that can help that uh, rain, rain gardens, things like that, that will help um, extreme rainfall sort of soak back into the soil. And then the, the favorite is there's an option to actually just decommission um, trails and different pieces of infrastructure and facilities as well. Danielle, um, may I ask a question? Yeah. So I'm really intrigued by this concept that, you, that we've brought up a couple of times today regarding, you know, sprinkling transitional language throughout my plan. I would like nothing better than to say, you know, this is this is happening, and all of these snowmobile trails that we're now planning for um, are are going to transition, uh, whether we like them or not. And you know, responsibly, there are certain activities I can allow on those existing trails, and ones that I can't. Um, but I can't even get I can't even get my audience to agree that it's happening. Uh, let alone buy into the fact that their beloved motorized consumptive activities might be replaced by fat bikes or, uh, you know, uh, you know, walking or they're instantly going to go, well, even if it does happen, uh, we'll just start using ATVs, which are the snowmobiles of summer. <laughs> and, um, you know, it'll be fine. And they're not appropriate in a lot of you know, we have snowmobile trails across, you know, places where conditions don't, would never um, tolerate, you know, that, that level of impact during the summer. So I, I, I apologize. Maybe that's just a bit of a rant or a cry for help. Um, but I, I, I am, I'm really interested in the idea of, of baking these things into my plan. But I just, I can't even, I want to throw up thinking of the public meeting. Uh, you know, once well, I released it. I think there's a, and I'm really interested to hear how Leslie and um, Kristen might cope with this as well. Uh, what came to mind instantly is that there's different ways that you can paint this narrative so that people can see maybe um, tipping points or thresholds and then secondary things that you might do. So you could still bake them into the plan, but say, you know, as long as winter is this time frame, you know, maybe we'll continue doing business as usual. But then once the spring changes, then we're going to offer more recreational opportunities and you could then, you know, enter that into the plan, fat biking, you know, Etc. So I think that that's one big way to do it. Leslie, did you have, I, I see you nodding your head. It seems like you have an idea, so I'll let you go. Well, yeah, I guess the other thing um, to think about is we'll be covering communication in a couple of weeks and talking about how we tell our stories to different audiences. And so um, you might want to dive a little bit deeper on that topic when we get there. Um, and there are some other ideas there that ways you can frame your story to resonate with different audiences. So I think both the, um, you know, thinking about, you know, those 
tipping points and thresholds when you would en enact your adaptation strategies that are that are more transition oriented. Mm -hmm. um, and then also thinking about how you communicate those ideas or like the, they go hand in hand. There's, there's also an opportunity in step four to sort of build a case. You know, there's a whole section for trade-offs and barriers um, to doing a tactic. So you could really spell out in great detail why a tactic is not good and it would be not recommended. And that could be ATV usage, you know what I mean? Like you could paint that picture, sort of get those feelings out on paper and present a, a solid case for how that might destroy certain ecosystem processes if. Yeah, you know, the fact that, that you I, can't even say it without laughing tells me you feel my pain. I do, but it doesn't mean that you can't do it. So that's the biggest part of the adaptation workbook and the main one of the main reasons why we created it is for people to document their ideas and to really spell out in great detail why something is a good idea, why something's a bad idea. And we also give you the option to not recommend a tactic. And so that could be all of your plan B tactics. If the plan A ones fail, then you would transition into those plan B ones. But it's really to show your work and that you've been thinking about this from several different perspectives. So I would say while you have the opportunity to drive your plan in this course, just really paint that picture and and then yes we can provide some tips for the communication aspect to the public thereafter but thank you both very much good luck <laughs> all right i think that's it for my slides i think i think i might have had an example oh I'm not sure this example really applies to this group, but really this example was just all about incorporating sort of local best management practices in times when you wouldn't really expect to do that. And so it, it's really that example was of a manager sort of being a little bit more nimble in circumstances of uh, more runoff in a winter season when they wouldn't typically expect to have that. Anyone have questions for Danielle on the watershed menu? Anyone have another menu they'd like to see? But not forestry. <laughs> I'd like to see um, tribal perspective. Yeah. Kristen, you can take this one. Awesome, great. Um, yeah, and I can see from the comments in the chat that we'll have a really vibrant climate communication discussion coming up, so, so that's great. Um, and it's also kind of a nice segue for this menu too, because in a lot of ways, the tribal adaptation menu can be a really great climate communication tool. And we're starting to use it and see it used more and more that way with different audiences. Um, but so some of the, the core aspects of the tribal adaptation menu is that this was very much a group effort. Um, so again, this, this was born out of partners coming to us with a need. Um, and in this case, you know, it was a, a group of um, people who are working on a project related to wild rice restoration. And they had been using some of our other menus to consider their project. And, you know, they generally had like, yeah, this is helpful. They had positive feedback about it. But um, the, the base of their comments was, you know, this isn't really how we think about things. And this isn't how we would phrase a lot of these adaptation actions. And so starting with that comment, um, we all collectively decided to really form a team to think about what would an adaptation menu look like that incorporated more of a tribal perspective and tribal values. Um, and so you can see the list of contributors here. This effort was really um, led primarily by Glyphwick, the Great Lakes Indian Fish and Wildlife Commission. So let's go to the next slide, maybe. Awesome. Um, so, you know, another key reasoning behind this menu or another key issue is just the fact that, 
you know, tribes are, are facing some significant challenges related to climate change. So, you know, in a lot of cases, there are these um, fixed boundaries that they're dealing with, um, either with reservation lands, um, treaty ceded territories, and really strong relationships that they have with beings in particular locations. And so without the ability to pick up and move where they're actually located, um, you know, that that poses some significant vulnerabilities and sig some significant challenges in terms of changing access um, to to uh, relations or um, you know, beings that might be important for cultural purposes. Next slide. And so, you know, the main comment from the group that that started this effort was a lot of the adaptation menus are great, but, but they're really reflective of Western science, they're reflective of Western literature. And, you know, as you've noted throughout the class, we refer to this as um, at, at these as resources to uh, help with natural resources management to, um, you know, uh, so, so using that very Western-centric language in terms of thinking about these things as natural resources. And so that was one of the first things that the group keyed in on right away. You know, this is not how we think about these things. We think about these things as relatives. We think about them as fellow beings. Um, so language and changing the language of this menu is a big focus for uh, the group of authors in this case. We, we've, we informally call it the TAM team, the Tribal Adaptation Menu Team. So I might, might refer to it as that. Um, and so, so yeah, this, this need to create a menu reflective of a kin-centric perspective was really key to, to this effort. So this was a, a really long writing process. Uh, what we did was take the whole group of authors and start with the forest menu, start with the forested watersheds menu, um, and some ideas from the agriculture menu as well, since those were the first three published, um, and really take a hard look at them um, from the author group, think about how uh, we might repurpose some of those strategies, how the language might change um, to be more reflective of indigenous values, um, think more carefully about the language and really incorporate um, some language specifically from uh, Ojibwe and Menominee um, into this menu. Uh, but, you know, it, it is designed to be used along with the adaptation workbook, but then also as a standalone resource for people just interested in it as a communication tool or a cultural revitalization tool or a brainstorming tool. Um, and so after a, a fairly lengthy process, a writing process, and a lot of great conversations, um, a lot of, of changes and iterations of this, it was published in 2019. Um, so the menu, as I've mentioned before, it has a unique focus. It contains new language, um, both in English and in Menominee um, and Ojibwe. Uh, it incorporates ideas related to cultural practices and community engagement, as well as the more traditional ecosystem focus that we've had in past menus. And um, it contains 14 strategies and 60 approaches. Uh, we think it's really important when, when demonstrating this menu to point out the first three strategies. So these are very different than other strategies that are, uh, than strategies that are contained in other menus. Um, they really focus in on addressing cultural practices, thinking about community engagement, recognizing the relationship between human and non-human beings. And the team felt that it was really important to put these strategies up front and center. So you can see the first three strategies written there. Um, one that we also added after a lot of conversation was the strategy two, learn through careful and respectful observation. Um, so that was really kind of a recognition that a lot of our menus more from a Western perspective are really focused on doing something now and getting something in on the ground. And, and you know, a lot of the authors felt that um, 
from a tribal perspective, it might be more important in some situations to really sit back, observe, and see what beings were doing themselves in response to climate change before taking any action. Next slide. Yeah, oh. I can explain this one if you want. Okay, great. Really quick. Okay, so um, an example tactic, if you just want to do all the animations, Leslie. Um, within the tribal adaptation menu, there's a, um, whew, a little too fast. Uh, <laughs> there's a strategy that is uh, really surrounds this idea of supporting tribal engagement in the environment. And, um, you know, very specifically, if we were to look at approach 3.1, maintain and revitalize traditional relationships and uses, um, this sort of, uh, this example stems out of this growing um, interest from especially um, federal and state land managers in the um, lake states to look towards tribal people to say, you know, to re-engage those cultural uses on the landscape. And a great example that's shown in this image is of um, a cultural burning. It was one of the first cultural burnings um, on the on Madeline Island, I believe, a few years ago, that it was one of the first ones that had been done um, in, in like a century. And um, the National Park Service, they worked really closely with local tribes in order to support the tribes in doing this cultural burn on the, the National Lakeshore land. So this is a great example of, um, of how, you know, these partnerships and um, can come together to support cultural and advancing these uh, traditional uses on the landscape. Great. Um, so the only other thing to point out on this is that this is not one of the workbooks that's integrated into the online format, since it's somewhat of a standalone resource, but it is out there, it's published, and you're welcome to um, look through this and use it offline to integrate these ideas into planning. Woo, sorry, I feel like I went on for a while about that, but... Um, <laughs> It's a really fun menu, so hopefully people are inspired to take a look at that. I have, I have a question. Sure. Um, so do, is there any examples of, of it being used, I mean, this methodology with other than those tribes there? Um, have other tribes um, used it in another climate, not necessarily in that forest Great Lake area? That's a great question. Um, we have had people outside of the lake states use it. Uh, we don't have a ton of examples up online now. Um, there are some people who have used it but haven't you know, felt that they want to put their work out in a demonstration page yet. Um, but I think that's still an open question for the group is how well does this work in areas outside of the lake states and with other cultures? And that was a big interest of the group is creating, you know, some kind of menu that could be edited or, or altered to reflect other Indigenous perspectives outside of just the, the Ojibwe and the Menominee focus of this menu. Um, so it has been used, I'd say, infrequently enough that we don't have a great handle on how well does this work in other landscapes. Okay. Now, I'm just searching for other examples that I could kind of look at in order to see recommendations that I can make. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Great question. Um, I'm realizing the time here, and so um, we probably don't have time to go through another menu, but I'm just going <laughs> to let you all know that there are all of these others available. Um, there's an urban forestry menu if you're interested in that and working in an urban area. We actually do have a new menu in press on urban forests and human health. And so if you're really interested in that, um, let me know and I can get you the pre-publication version of that. Um, we have an agriculture menu. And so that one has a very different flavor. It's focused on agricultural systems. Um, the forest carbon management um, menu is similar to the forestry menu, but focuses um, on the co-benefits of adaptation to carbon and um, climate mitigation. And we have the non-forested 
wetlands menu. So that's very focused on a very particular ecosystem type. Um, we have a few that are almost ready for prime time. The wildlife menu is, is in publication review right now. So if you're interested in that one, we can probably get that one to you as well. And then there's a fire adapted ecosystems menu that was developed by our partners at the Southwest Fire Climb Group. And so that actually has a lot of um, strategies kind of more focused on, on Southwest ecosystems. So if you're working in that part of the country, that might be helpful to you. Um, so that's the whirlwind tour. <laughs> um, thanks for joining us today. And please let us know if you um, want any of those menus that are still in development for perusal. And we'll see you week after next. So next week, no lecture, no discussion. So you have a freebie week. Work on your projects, not to take off. <laughs>